Hi class, the last chapter is carbonyl condensation reactions. A uh, couple words here, carbonyl, that should tell you that we will be talking about the C double bond O. Condensation means that there will be some small molecule, small molecules like water or ammonia, which will be given off as a result of the reaction. And of course, reaction is how two, react two um, reactants, A and B, might come together to give you a third product. So this is an extension of chapter 19, but it's a different kind of reactivity that we are going to take a look. If you recall what we discussed in chapter 19, it was all about the nucleophilic addition reaction on the C double bond O. So you had an electron rich species, the nucleophile, which attacked the electrophilic carbon because oxygen being more electronegative is going to pull electrons towards itself. And in that sense, we essentially uh, took advantage of the electrophilic character of the carbon of the carbonyl group and how it reacted with different nucleophiles just to kind of get you to think about uh, we talked about the water in presence of acid or base and that gives gave you the hydrate we talked about the cyanohydrin uh, which works better when you throw in a little bit of base there we talked about um, your, our acetal formation in presence of a catalytic amount of an acid we talked about addition of witty chemistry of course it would be incomplete if i don't mention grenard and then we also took a look at nucleophiles which could so these were all kind of cases where we had the one two addition and then we had the one four addition in which you could have a c double bond o which is connected to the double bond uh, in a conjugate manner so that is the one four addition so now your nucleophiles um, starts to attack this fourth position electrons move and oxygen is the one that will get the negative charge so we talked about all of those um, in chapter 19 where primarily our carbonyl or maybe adjacent atoms on the carbonyl were serving as uh, electrophile in this particular chapter, we are going to take advantage of the nucleophilic behavior. So it's kind of closely related to the alpha beta um, conjugate addition. Uh, not exactly that, but we would be able to take advantage of what happens. Is there a way that we would be able to take advantage of the alpha position of... Um, of our uh, of our carbonyl and how could we use that as a nucleophile to react with other electrophilic species so notice what i have here we have said in the past that if you have a ketone it can tautomerize depending on the reaction conditions you could have more amount of ketone or more amount of the enolate but we have said that at any given point of time a ketone can go through a 1-3 shift. Recall that from organic 1. This is position 1, this is position 3, this is position 2, and this is position 3. So you can have a hydrogen which will shift from position 3 to position 1. So you have the electronegative uh, oxygen it's going to pull the proton these electrons are going to fall in i'm going to erase the three just so that we can see so you have so you have the enol and in the past we have said of course if we had to ever go back it could be shown that these electrons are going to come back in. That's going to generate a positive charge. And so that negative can just pull the uh, 
hydrogen and that's how those electrons move so long story short if you have a ketone or an aldehyde there is going to be a corresponding enol or an enolate notice you use the word eight sulfate nitrate chlorate etc you use that if you have an oxygen right connected to so we talked about that in general chemistry one that that's where you would have your um a polyatomic ion right so we use the negative charge in order to describe the enolate so the difference between enol and enolate is that the enol has the oh the enolate will have the negative charge on the oxygen that's how you distinguish between the two so the first reaction the first condensation reaction that we would talk about is the aldol reaction or sometimes also referred to as the aldol condensation aldol condensation now back in the day i remember when i was in 12th grade and i heard aldol condensation um I was like, I was just so curious at the way the reaction worked and um, how exactly, you know, the, the, the product gets generated. Uh, I was intrigued by that. And so I wanted to find out which country Aldol belonged to, right? Because you have Williamson ether synthesis, you have Wittig reaction, you have all these uh, uh, novel reactions that happen. Um, so I was very curious uh, which 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 country uh, Aldol was from, and I was unfortunately not able to find that information in the books that I had. Uh, come college, um, I was like, well, that's a similar chemistry, but now we are looking at mechanism. Perhaps they would have that information some there, somewhere there. Uh, I was not able to find that information still, so it's still that that question kind of stayed with me and um internet was born and they said that internet has answers to everything because people across the world keep posting things keep uh, finding things and so it's a great resource uh, provided you know where to where to find your answers from and so i was like okay well i need to get on internet and uh, the first couple words, anybody want to guess what would I have typed on it? We did not have the Google search engine back then. Uh, it was called Yahoo before Google took over. So uh, what would I have searched? You are right. I did search Aldol condensation because I was so curious. Where was he from? So um, it was not until actually I was sitting in my graduate level class in which uh, we were still, believe it or not, I started that journey in 12th grade and it was still being taught in graduate level, just different aspects of it and a uh, different kind of substrate. Uh, so the level, the depth of that uh, goes to a different level altogether. But anyway, it was not until then that I'm sitting and I'm like, aha, I had an aha moment. So I'm going to share that aha moment with you. It's ald all. So it's not the name of the scientist, but rather the name of the product that you get. You would have an aldehyde. You would have an alcohol. So your end story, your end product that you're going to um, uh, get at the end of the day is called aldol because it will contain both an aldehyde as well as an alcohol. Just a little tidbit on the side. All right, let's take a look as to what happens and how do we go about that. So I have an aldehyde here. The aldehyde that you need for an aldol reaction to be successful must have alpha hydrogens. Notice that I'm calling this alpha hydrogens. A lot of the times people say, oh, it's the beta. It's not the beta. Your functionality is right over here. The carbon that holds the functionality is your alpha carbon. The one next door will be beta and so on and so forth. So uh, I, have an, an, I have an aldehyde which must contain some alpha hydrogen atoms. If they are not there, then you will not be able to show aldol condensation um, in that particular aldehyde. So that's a prerequisite. Um, when you treat that with a base, two such molecules are going to come together. And notice what's happening. I still have my aldehyde. This is my alpha hydrogen. And 
this is my beta hydrogen. So I have basically chain elongated your new bond. Your new bond that you formed is going to be right over here. That's your new bond that has formed. And it is essentially that two molecules have uh, condensed with each other. The word is not condensate. The word is condensed with each other. So let's stick to the jargon a little bit. Um, and let's take a look how this reaction takes place. But I really want to get your attention right now why we call it aldol. We still have the aldehyde. And we have a beta hydroxy. So we have an alcohol. That is the reason that we are calling it an aldol. Let's take a look at how the reaction takes place. I'll continue to use perhaps acetaldehyde so you can follow along. So I have here the acetaldehyde and I said we need two of these. You have a CH3 so you have three hydrogens. And we are running this reaction in presence of a base and water is your solvent. So what do you think will happen with the presence of the base? If you're thinking abstraction of a proton, absolutely correct. So you will have your negative charge, which is going to pick up. It's going to pick up the acidic hydrogens. Why am I calling the acidic hydrogens at the alpha carbon acidic? Because there is a, a CHO. There is the CHO which is going to induce, it's going to cause the dipole induction to happen. So this part of the molecule is going to pull electrons towards itself and hence your hydrogens are acidic. We know cardio from the beginning of this term if you did not do that in uh, organic one so hydroxide is going to pull your uh, uh, hydrogen where would the electrons go the electrons will go on top of the carbon carbon bond what would that lead to that would lead to movement of um, your pi electrons on top of the oxygen so you end up getting your Enolate, oxygen has a negative charge. Double bond is on the carbon. Carbon, perhaps I number it. And so if you were to say that perhaps this position is one, this position is two, one is where my oxygen with a negative charge is, two is where the double bond. So you're forming a double um, bond between one and two. Hydrogen remains the, where, the way it was. Notice that this molecule overall has a negative charge. So you would want to call this the enolate and it is going to serve as the donor molecule donor because there is a negative charge which can be donated to anything which is electrophilic so my question to you is is there an electrophile in this close vicinity do you see an electrophile well i see another molecule which is your acceptor aldehyde and so if you bring in your electrons back on top of oxygen now your c double bond c between one and two is going to serve as a donor as a nucleophile for anything which is willing to accept electrons are going to move on top of the oxygen so i'm going to call that three and four in the donor molecule so let's take a look where the new bond may have gotten formed Sounds like to me, I have the C double bond OH, you have the 1, 2, we have formed a new bond. So maybe let's make that in black. I still have the O negative from the acceptor after the reaction took place. So if I were to number, I would say this is one, this is two, this is three, 
this is 4. And now I have this reaction happening in water, right? So I could certainly pick up that proton from water and that would give you an aldol. You have your starting donor aldehyde. You have formed a new bond between the alpha carbon of the donor. So this part is coming from the donor and the carbonyl of the acceptor. This part is coming from the acceptor. The hydrogen is still where it is, right? So we have, in other words, clicked, condensed two, uh, two molecules together. One has served as the donor. It is, again, the alpha carbon of the donor and the carbonyl of the acceptor that go through the reaction. So if I was, were to highlight um, both of those reactive groups, that's the acceptor that you're going to form the bond at and the donor is right over here. So you're going to connect those two together. This product that you have obtained is called as the beta hydroxy aldehyde. Or the aldol. Now, the reaction doesn't quite stop here. You can take it one step further and you can carry out um, loss of water because we want to remove a molecule of water by simply heating it in presence of an acid or a base. So a base mediated or an acid mediated uh, loss of water dehydration is possible. The question is, uh, where should the double bond uh, form. So should the double bond form, because when the beta hydrogens will be removed, you your hydroxy is over here. Your hydroxy that will be removed is over here. Um, the question is which hydrogens should we remove? Should we remove the hydrogens which are here, which are perhaps the A hydrogens, or should we remove the hydrogens over here, which are the B hydrogens. Notice that if you remove the A hydrogens, that would mean that the double bond will come in at that location. If you, on the other hand, uh, remove the double bond on the other side, then the double bond will be on the other side. Which one do you like a little bit more? You should pause me at this point of time. If you pick the one in black, that is the appropriate answer. And the reason for that is, you got it. You have resonance in this part of the molecule from starting from the carbonyl, extending all the way to the fourth position. So you have, or you can form the alpha, beta, unsaturated ketones and aldehydes that we saw in the last segment of the uh, chapter 19. They are basically generated via an aldol condensation reaction. So it's time to actually um, write down a letter to your lab partner and write a letter to your lab partner and um, tell them what are the prerequisites for an aldol reaction to take place? Because we have in um, our experience in Organic 2 seen these reaction conditions three times. So we have, I'll, I'll, I'll make a case for you. Um, we have seen that we could have an aldehyde and a base in presence of water, this base, of course, is coming from sodium hydroxide, um, and that essentially attacks, right? And that gives you your hydrate. So we have seen the formation of a hydrate. One, two, one, two, one, two. You have added two OHs on the same carbon atom. We call it a hydrate, hydrate formation. 
we also took a look at the Kenny Zero reaction in which we did not have a alpha position. We had, I think benzaldehyde was the molecule that we used. So I can show you again with benzaldehyde. And you can do that for formaldehyde as well. And when you treat that with a base, two molecules were required. And the hydroxide is going to attack. Electrons are going to move. Of course, you have added an OH. And then that will react with another molecule. So you do need two, um, two molecules of the aldehyde. That was the self uh, disproportionation, if you recall, the self redox. And so the hydride is going to move. The hydrogen is going to move from one molecule to the other. Um, and it's going to reduce it. So one molecule is going to become... The carboxylic acid the other molecule is going to become the alcohol so one went from aldehyde to carboxylic acid the other went from aldehyde to alcohol so one is reduction the other is oxidation so we had two different reactions, two different uh, redox, and since it's the same molecule that is serving as the oxidizing agent and the reducing agent, we called it the disproportionation reaction. And I gave you the example of copper at that point of time. Um, the third one, which we have just discussed, is for something like acetaldehyde. And we are treating that again with base. So your solvent is water, of course. And I said form the bond, we will need two of these. So maybe you can draw them side by side because you're starting out, it's important to really recognize the step. Hopefully you're drawing with me and not just watching, that's not active. Um, so now I said that you have to form the bond between the alpha of the donor and carbonyl of the acceptor. That's where the bond will be. And since it will not be a pentavalent, uh, carbon, it cannot be a pentavalent, these electrons will have to move on top of oxygen, right? That's what we talked about. That means the donor gets to keep its um, aldehyde. The new bond is formed between the alpha of the donor and the carbonyl of the acceptor. And your product looks like CHO. This carbon is going to form a new bond. That's the darkened, deepened bond. OH. And the methyl is hanging there. And now when you subject that to treatment with hydrolysis, just heating it, the OH and one of the hydrogens from here will be lost to give you a resonance stabilized ketone or an aldehyde as the case may be. So that was the case of aldehyde. And so it gave you an aldol. If you use a ketone, then you will have a beta hydroxy ketone, but it's a beta hydroxy carbonyl compound that we are talking about. So my question to you is, you have an aldehyde in each of them. You have a carbonyl compound in each of them, and you have sodium hydroxide in each of them. How do you distinguish when do you have to do what? Because um, come exam four, when we would have talked about uh, two different um, molecules, how, how, would you, how would you distinguish between them? So what I want you to do in the next five minutes is uh, kind of study and ask the question. What is the question that I always ask you to ask? If you are thinking, what's different... I have officially sharmanized you. 
Yes, ladies and gentlemen, you have to ask the question, what is different? So backtrack to the last slide and see what are the different components? What are the things that you can change? And what I want you to do is write a letter. I want you to write a letter to your lab partner. and explain what did you find that was different which reaction conditions will allow aldol versus cani zero versus hydrate formation. This is a task. Write a letter to your lab partner explaining which reaction conditions will allow aldol versus canizero versus hydrate formation. At this point of time, I want you to pause me and spend the next five minutes in just doing that. So here's my letter. Dear CHM 2211, I learned some cool reaction conditions that were intriguing to me. So I wanted to share some tips and tricks with you. So what are the tips and tricks that I found? Let's see. I'm going to divide my letter into three areas just so that um, my, my lab partner, which is CHM2211, is able to is able to follow along and has this nice and organized, right? So the first thing that we did was that we had an aldehyde and we treated that with the base. Of course, it was water that we were uh, interested in adding and we formed our hydrate. That was the first reaction that we had. The question I asked in terms of what's different was, well, um, is this reaction going to be possible with maybe something like formaldehyde? What's the answer, do you think? Absolutely. In fact, it's going to be a lot faster because in case of formaldehyde, you do not have any any R group, so it's not going to affect, it's not going to cause problems in induction, it's not going to cause problems in um, uh, sterics, it's all going to be good. So any aldehyde or ketone, ketone of course much lesser than the aldehyde, is going to cause this reaction to take place. The key thing here is that you would um, you would need it to be a dilute solution. The reason why I say it should be dilute solution is because you want your molecules to be sort of far away. You don't want uh, too many of the CHOs right next to each other. Because if they are, guess what? A side reaction, which can be the formation of that enolate and then self-condensation, which is the aldol reaction, could start to take place. So you don't want that to happen. That means you would want to keep lots of water. You, want to, you would want to keep your uh, base uh, nice and strong. And um, any aldehyde or ketone will go through this reaction. So the key thing here is the concentration. If you compare that to the Canizero reaction, the Canizero reaction had the benzaldehyde and formaldehyde. Those are the examples that I was giving you. How are these different? So again, I'm asking you the question, what is different? And I really want to get your attention to the carbon next to the aldehyde right over here. Does it have any hydrogen atoms? No. There is no carbon atom in case of formaldehyde. Forget about the hydrogen. In, 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 in case of your um, hydrate formation, it could really be. The word is any, 
right? It did not matter how, how or why the reaction will take place. So you have over here, your the difference is happening in uh, the lack of, of, of any hydrogen atom. So here you would want to say that there are no alpha carbons or alpha hydrogens. You still will need two molecules. What does that mean? That means that the concentration has got to be high. So the molecules should be in close vicinity of each other so that they can react. Only then would you be able to say that that initial attack of the, the hydroxide, which allows the formation of the oxidized carboxylic acid and be able to reduce the other molecule that will not happen if the two the donor of the hydride and the acceptor of the hydride the one that undergoes oxidation and the one that undergoes reduction if they are not in close vicinity to each other so that was our canizero reaction and the last one is the aldol the prerequisite for that is that you have to have that alpha hydrogen. So if you have an alpha hydrogen located, that will have the potential to form the enolate, which will then react with and give you your beta hydroxy this is the third time you're seeing the same mechanism so hopefully you're writing along and chugging along so the prerequisites what is the requirement for aldol your requirement is that you must have alpha hydrogens must have that concentration must be high in case of the canizero concentration needs to be high but you do not have any alpha hydrogens. And in case of hydrate, well, any aldehyde or ketone, irrespective of what's present at the alpha hydrogen will happen. It just needs dilute solutions so that the carbonyl is where the majority of the reaction takes place. So if I were to summarize, because I love process maps, and if I had to come up with a process map, I would ask the question, I would ask, does the aldehyde or the ketone, does that actually have a concentrated solution or dilute solution? If it's concentrated, we are thinking either canizero or aldol. If it's dilute, we are thinking hydrate formation. Then we ask another question. Does it have alpha hydrogens? So what's the status of alpha hydrogens? If they are present, you get aldol. If they are absent, you get canizero. And we're good. We're done. A student once asked me, uh, what was the definition of high concentration, low concentration? Typically, something like 0.1 molar or higher is going to be considered high concentration, low concentrations in lab. Low concentrations are like 0 0.01 and lower than that. All right, so um, let's take a look at what it might look like for a ketone. Of course, we know that ketones are much lesser uh, reactive as compared to your aldehydes. And so notice the use of, you have the C double bond O, you have your, you have your CH2s. It is going to be much less reactive than aldehydes because it is sterically hindered. But if you do have two molecules, great idea is to just draw them out right next to each other. 
that's the best way to draw out the product and what did i say i said that so we'll call one donor one acceptor the best way to do that is to form a bond between the alpha carbon of the donor and the carbonyl of the acceptor so you have over here your alpha carbon of the donor which is going to form the bond with the c double bond o of the acceptor so we are going to go ahead and form the bond right like that electrons are going to move on top of oxygen that is going to generate the c double bond o new bond is right over here you have your oxygen with a negative charge which is of course going to pull the electrons notice what we have here exactly the same um, uh, uh, setup and so the reactivity uh, of the O negative uh, it's going to pull the proton from your water and it's going to give you your product notice only 22 percent so this makes a fantastic uh, you know sort of mini case study for the reasoning type questions I could totally just ask you um, that in case of formaldehyde or in case of acetaldehyde um, you, you, you saw that the reaction went all the way towards the product. So in case of acetaldehyde, the reaction is uh, two moles of that sodium hydroxide um, gives you your beta hydroxy aldol and you had maybe 80% yield. And in case of cyclohexanone, sodium hydroxide, and so we have, not the aldehyde, you have your ketone. This is only 22%. This was more than 80. Um, why is that? And you would say, uh, if you have to pick, you would say, like pick choices, you would say that ketones are uh, sterically hindered as well as electronically, uh, they are not as electrophilic as compared to uh, your aldehyde. And so that makes, um, that makes your uh, aldehyde way more reactive as compared to your ketone. Over here, I'm showing you exactly what I have been talking about. We have the base picking up the proton generating the enolate that is going to be my donor molecule donor molecule attacks at the carbonyl that becomes my acceptor molecule you have formed a new bond between the donor that's your carbon that's a new bond that's getting generated a proton exchange takes place with water so you have the hoh that we have been showing that will generate that will give you your product all right.